rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, so good to see you all. How's everybody doing this morning? I know. I see, man, the brothers ain't telling the truth. It ain't no games on. And so, man, we ain't doing that well right now, right? We need some games, right? We need some football, some basketball. We need some. Don't nobody watch no baseball, right? Anyway, so, anyway, so they, we got baseball and stuff on. Well, it's good to see you all on this morning. So glad that you guys are with us to worship God and celebrate God on today. I'm going to try to sit down in my seat and preach this whole sermon today, all right? Is that cool? Smile at me. I'm going to try to sit right here and preach this whole sermon, all right? And the reason I don't want to stand up, because when you stand up and a black guy talk loud, they think he mad. And, boy, I don't want y'all to think I'm mad, I'm upset, I'm discouraged. Ain't nothing like that. I just came to talk to y'all, right? Now, but when I'm on a basketball court, I scream loud, it's cool. When I'm up here sometimes, it's cool. But on touchy issues, when you get loud, people get scared, right? And so I'm going to try to sit here in my seat and talking calmly um, for the entire time on today. Y'all did all right? Yeah. All righty. Well, I want to I, I make a confession today. Um, you all know that this week was a strategic week in our country, in our world. Um, we had this week where Roe versus Wade was overturned. Y'all remember what it is? It was actually overturned on this week. And so with that being overturned on this week, it's kind of um, further, it didn't cause a divide in our country. It further punctuated the divide that's in our country already. And so I want to make a confession today. Um, uh, zoom the camera in, please. Um, I'm going to confess today. Boy, I don't come to divide anybody today. I'm not against anyone on today. I don't want to be insensitive towards anybody, any background, any circumstance on today. And so I'm not coming out trying to attack anybody. I know we got two people that are coming out. We got people who are praising God because of the decision. We got people who are protesting this week because of Roe versus Wade. Amen. And so I come there, I, I, I want to make a confession that as long as I can remember, my mom is, um, is was an obstetrical nurse. And so my, my mom used to teach birthing as a nurse. And so I used to go with her. Remember the reel to reel um, feeling when had to have to reel but you had to load it on this side, turn it, and then get to come through. And so I used to run the film for my mom when I was a little boy, about seven or eight years old. I called her to verify the dates, but we couldn't figure it out. But um, anyway, um, I've been around um, life issues for a long time. And so I come from a healthcare family. Um, I worked in healthcare before I came into ministry, and so I was involved with healthcare administration. Got a master's degree in that, helping take care of people and their health, make sure people were healthy. And so health issues are very close to my heart. I think about those issues all the time. And so this issue about this um, idea of abortion is an issue that's kind of close to my heart, close to my mind. Amen? And so I want to attack that issue today. And if, if you want to give my sermon a title, I guess I'll call it Don't Abort the Mission. Don't abort the mission. And so, and so um, they're very well-meaning, fully sanctified, God-loving, God-committed Christians who end up on different sides of this issue. And so where you stand on abortion is not the litmus test for your Christianity. And so also we want to take one issue that's not the litmus test for Christianity and make that the litmus test for Christianity. And so this issue of abortion is a very important issue, but it's not the litmus test to say if you're a believer or if you're not a believer, if you're going to heaven or if you're not going to heaven. The reality is it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and your proximity, your belief, and your disposition towards that which gets you into heaven. Amen? Amen. Every other issue may be important, but it will not get you into heaven. Now, I've got, I've got another confession. I used to be pro-choice. Smile at me. I used to be pro-choice. I was pro-choice until I came to seminary, and um, even when I was in the healthcare field, I was pro-choice. I was I like, a woman ought to have a right to do what she wants to do with her own body and make her own decisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then I read a book called The Sanctity of Life by Charles Swindoll. It's called The Sanctity of Life by Charles Swindoll. But then I got through reading that book, I had shifted my position from pro-choice to pro-life. And I'll explain more of that as we talk today. Is that cool? All righty. I want to read two passages. Um, this issue of abortion, the actual term abortion is actually not used in the scriptures. And so what happened was, well, boy, show me in the Bible where it used the term abortion. Well, show me in the Bible where it used the term segregation. 
Okay, and so there are a ton of issues that don't show up where the actual term doesn't show up in the Bible, but the Bible still addresses it, or biblical principles have to be applied to it. Amen? So I want to read two scriptures, and I want you all to turn off on me online. Even if you disagree, listen. And, um, and But I want you all to walk out. Ushers, lock the doors. Uh, uh, smile at me uh, today, all right? Y'all good? The first passage comes from Luke chapter 1. In those days, start at verse 39, in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now watch this now. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. The baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, boy, the, the, I'm, I'm going to be honest, boy, this, this, this passage is not centered around the, the abortion debate, but this passage does purely address the reality of life inside the womb and babies responding inside the womb. Are we tracking together? The second passage I'm going to read to you is um, Exodus, chapter, it's Exodus chapter 20, um, verse 13. You guys good? Y'all still good? Exodus 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. We'll start right there. That's part of the Ten Commandments. Are we tracking together? And so, and so we come to this issue of abortion. There are a lot of emotions. There are a lot of feelings. There are a lot of um, anxiety. I didn't come here to start a fight today. We tracking together. One thing I learned when it comes to this issue um, or more issues biblically is that very often we have we form a conviction before examination. We form a conviction based upon what's on the news, um, um, what's on CNN, what's on um, SB, um, MSNBC, what's on Facebook, but have we gone to the Word of God to see what God has to say about it? And so, and so I'm not here to argue, I'm not here to debate. I also want to say this, is that disagreement does not mean disrespect. Amen. We live in a culture and a world now where if you disagree with somebody, then they consider that to be disrespectful. And so we got to grow up and mature and understand that, boy, disagreement does not mean I'm disrespecting you. So I don't have to go along with your view, go along with your ideals, go along with your philosophy, and um, I'm just to be respectful. Respect means, you know, you got your view, I've got my view, you hold your view, I hold my view. I still value you in spite of what your view is, and you still value me in spite of what my view is. But to disagree with your view does not mean I'm being disrespectful. Are we tracking together? Now, I got a long sermon. There ain't no football games and basketball games on, so I can take my time. Amen? Okay, only half of y'all said amen already. I want to, I've got six words. I want to talk about it. Six words I want to talk about today. Six words. You can, you can write these words down if you like. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got six words I want to say. Number one word is compassion. The next word is conception. The third word is consideration. The fourth word is clarification. The fifth word is correction. And the sixth word is communication. I got six words when it comes to this area of abortion, this Roe versus Wade issue. I've got six words, compassion, conception, consideration, clarification, correction, and communication. Y'all good? The first word is compassion. Let's pray for those who have participated in the reality of abortion. You know, we start off with the fight. Boy, put your dukes up. Let's fight you on this side. I'm on that side. And boy, now we're going to duke this thing out. And boy, you don't value women and you don't value men and you don't value society. Let's just have compassion. Let's start with compassion. Let's start that we are our brother's keeper. Let's start that God wants us to love one another and not mutilate one another. Let's start on the, uh, um, 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 with, with the issue. No, no matter where you land on the issue, I need to treat you with dignity, with respect, and boy, honor you, and, and we'll be able to hang out with you. Let's start right there with compassion. Amen. Let's start with this, that you know what? There's a mother who has had an abortion, and she's gone through it physically, but now she's got to live through the reality emotionally. No matter what the law is, what's her heart feeling like? No matter what the legislators say, how does she feel emotionally after going through that? There are fathers who have encouraged or cursed a woman 
to get an abortion. And so now there are men on the other side now who feel guilty because they've got additional children or an additional child, but they coerced another woman because they didn't want to step up and pay the bill. They got the thrill, but didn't want to pay the bill. I know, I be tripping sometimes, right? But I'm trying to keep it on the level track. Go back and understand what I'm saying, right? So now you encourage some woman to go and get a divorce because you didn't want to step up. There are physicians and medical staff who encouraged or facilitated an abortion. Now they have to live with the residue of that decision. There are political officials who encouraged or facilitated abortion through legislation. So now one of the big issues now is that, is that man, we've had this thing around for 50 years. And so after 50 years, they want to come back. And, and, and now after 50 years, they want to change precedent and law. Well, how, how long were black folks in slavery? And as you say, after 40, you know, don't change, don't change racism and segregation and, 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 boy, and boy, all of that after 400 years. It was 400 years until they changed the law. You didn't say at that point, well, you know what, just keep it the same because it's been that way for 400 years. But now after 50 years, they're pissing you know what, we don't want to change the law because boy, it's just been in place for 50 years. <clears throat> Watch this now. We need to have compassion. You know, when you're really in Jesus, boy, you really walk with Jesus, you, you may have your views, you may have dispute. But John chapter 1, verse, first, um, um, verse, verse 14 says, and he became flesh and dwelt among us. And then it says this, he was full of grace and truth. You know what our challenge is, but we got people who tend to be at one of the extremes. We got people who are full of grace and, boy, just ignore truth. You know, but it don't matter what truth is, but we're going to love you, we're going to support you, we're going to encourage you, we're going to applaud you, we're going to um, elevate you, we're going to give you a platform, no matter what truth says. Then there are other people on the truth side. Truth, 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 truth. Well, we hear what the truth is, and boy, the truth should set you free. Well, sometimes the truth needs a little bit of velvet to go around it. And you can't keep hitting people with bricks all the time. But with Jesus, these two come together. And says he, he was full of grace and truth. Not grace or truth, not truth or grace. He was full of grace and truth. Dr. Mark Bailey, my former president when I was in seminary a number of years ago, he once prayed that we don't emphasize God's grace to the point that it diminishes his holiness. So we, we, we don't want to emphasize grace so much that it emphasizes the holiness of God. So well, that's my first word. My first word is compassion. So I want to start my sermon off today a little bit later with prayer. And I want to pray for those who have participated in any kind of way with abortion. No matter what the law is, you've got to live with the residue and the reality and the emotional state of having an abortion. Let's pray. So, Father, we come to you on this morning, God, and we do thank you and praise you, Father, for who you are, God. You're a great God. You're a mighty God. You're a powerful God. And Lord, I know, God, that Satan wants to use this issue, God, to further divide our country. And that, God, people are doing ungodly things in the name of truth, in the name of righteousness, in the name of holiness. And, God, there is no point, God, where you will cause us, God, to go and destroy our fellow brothers. It's interesting, God, that, Lord, people are fighting for the, for the right to destroy a child. But then they go and destroy somebody else. So I pray, God, that, Lord, you would help us to see clearly today, Father. And I pray, God, that you would enlighten us and work in our heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen? Amen? Our first word is compassion. Our second word is conception. Can you all say conception? conception? Can you type conception into your chat right there? Conception. The process of impregnation and the origination of life. You know, ethically and medically, it's possible today for women to become pregnant and never have interactions with another man. And so, well, that's why technology is, but we're not talking about that side, artificial reproductive technologies. We're talking about this issue of abortion. And so, boy, what's the process of impregnation? What's the process of conception? Number one, you've got marital sex. You've got conception in the context of marital sex. You've got, you have conception in the context of premarital sex. 
to somebody who you may be with, but they're not your mate, they're not your spouse, they're not your husband, they're not your wife. You've got, um, 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 you've got conception in extramarital sex where one or both can be married, but step outside the relationship, impregnate somebody else, now someone becomes pregnant. Then you have criminal sex where someone is raped and then now they are impregnated. You've got familial sex where um, we call it incest where, where both family members have sex with one another and then now somebody ends up pregnant. Then you have recreational sex. Just got drunk. Just got high. If you can't smile, just, just show me your teeth. All right, all right, all right. Just recreational. Well, you know what? Didn't end up doing it. Now I'm end up pregnant. All right. Then you have immoral sex where you've got people who are strung out on drugs. I was, um, I was um, driving down um, the highway a couple of weeks ago, and I was going to visit a senior citizen, and then my alarm went off on my phone, and, and but by the grace of God, I took my computer with me that morning. And um, I was headed there, my alarm went off, and I said, well, you've got, to be, um, you've got a lecture on Zoom for a class at Dallas Seminary. In 10 minutes, I said, oh, my goodness, boy, boy, boy. thank God I got my computer. You know, I can teach whenever, right? So, boy, I pull over on the side of the road over there on um, 35 around Atlanta. I forget what other streets it were. And so I pulled my computer up, got my hotspot going, plugged my computer up, logged in, and then a prostitute come knock on my window. I said, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> I'm online, I teach a seminary class. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm good, right? Now watch this now. She's probably in prostitution, not because her morals are low, but because she's strung out on drugs. She's trying to get her next fix, and she's willing to do whatever's necessary to get her next fix. And guys do the same thing when you go to the right communities. Are we tracking together? That is immoral sex. The problem with the pro-choice position is that it makes humans lord over every aspect of the birthing process. So watch this now. Many of us don't think about conception, and we don't think about the conception and, and boy, how the child was conceived or the responsibility of conceiving, and then now we want somebody else to cover for us. We want to abnegate ourselves the responsibility of conception. Are we tracking together? I, I, need, I need you guys to think with me today, all right? Just, just think with me for a minute, all right? Just, you ain't got to do it. I said, but please consider what I say. We said, well, well you, you are stripping the woman of her rights. And my question is, did we strip her of her rights when she laid down with that dude? I ain't trying to be mean. I ain't trying to be ugly. But I am trying to be real. You weren't talking about rights when you laid down, apart from incest, apart from, apart from rape. When it came to conception, you were a full participant, a voluntary participant in the action. But then now on the backside, you will say, you know what? I, I want to have my fun on the front end. And then I also want to have the right to cover up and eradicate what happened during the act. So when we're talking about abortion and we're talking about um, a woman's rights, why don't we start the conversation with conception and not start the conversation with abortion? Are we tracking together? And so, and so you had the right to lay down or not lay down. You had the right to use, with all this contraception we have today, You have enough contraception never, ever, ever, ever to get pregnant. Are we tracking together? But then we come back on the back end and say, well, you know what? I can't afford to pay for this child. It's going to inconvenience my career, et cetera, et cetera. Humans make themselves Lord when they conceive outside of God's will. We say, Lord, I don't want to follow your plan. Lord, I'm going to do my own plan. Humans make themselves Lord when they want to determine what happens to the life that God has allowed them to have stewardship, but not lordship. Amen. It's one of the hardest things in the world watching your kids grow up, and you have less and less and less influence over their lives. 
And good parents always want to cover their kids, take care of their kids, watch over their kids. Then you get this reminder that, boy, this is a stewardship, not lordship. You get the privilege to take care of what God has entrusted to you for a season. And as these kids grow and mature, they step into their own adulthood, their own decisions, their own directions, and you can no longer decide when and what they do. When it comes to this area of abortion, I think we step outside of stewardship into lordship. You step from stewardship to lordship when you overstep the boundaries and the authority that God has given you as a parent. Are we tracking together? Who gives you the right to determine if this child lives or not when you are not the author of their life? In Genesis it says, and God breathed into them and they became a living soul. Are we tracking together? Okay? And so guys, you never have life apart from God's authorization. I don't want to be insensitive here, but that we got all kind of technology trying to get people pregnant. And some just can't get pregnant. Why not? Because until God gives the thumbs up, it just doesn't happen. Biblically, we don't just need more information to address these biblical and um, ethical issues. We need wisdom. We don't just need information. We need, how do we put all this together to make a decision. We don't just need wisdom. According to James, we need a wisdom from above. And so what happens is, is but we've got people who are not functioning with the wisdom from above. They are functioning with the wisdom from below. And God is saying, I need you to use my wisdom, not just merely man's wisdom. Are we together? So I want to apologize to you guys again. Um, Ms. Womack and I have kept this from you guys for years. We got more children than we told you guys about. I know, and it got quiet. You all see our eight children bouncing around here, and that's a lot of kids. I'm ticked off with the government because at some point you can't get a child credit. I think it's after six kids. I called my accountant and said, where are my other two kids? They said, sorry, government stops at six. Smile at me. We didn't figure it was important to share with you guys and tell you guys this information. And this woman, well, she knows all about it, and boy, she's fully aware of it. And but we don't go around talking about it. But the reality is, the cultural pressure gets to us. We actually have twelve children. When I first met her, she told me she wanted ten kids. I, I wasn't concerned about that because I figured she never had a pregnancy. She knew what she was talking about. We'll figure out what happens later on. After some back pain, some deliveries, she started taking her number up, not down. So we got pregnant the first time, and we had a miscarriage. And so many don't count that child. Then we had, I think we had three or four kids. I said, Cynthia, it's time to stop. She said, well, well we got to trust God, preacher. And I said, well, but we got to use some sense, too. We're having too many kids. We got Proverbs, the book of wisdom. She said, well, God wants to close my womb. He can do it any time he wants to. So we having more kids for a while. I said, you know, the Lord, he hear my prayers. He's showing her. <laughs> who's <this? laughs> I, I, I really thought that way. <laughs> He's showing her who's really, you know, got the wisdom in the household. Then we had, we had two miscarriages. And then we had an ectopic pregnancy. You might know what an ectopic pregnancy is? That's where the baby kind of gets caught up in the, in the tube and doesn't make it all the way through. And I almost lost my wife then. I won't tell you the, I'll spray that whole story. So the question became, okay, then we had somewhat of an abortion. Because with an ectopic pregnancy, the baby is lodged in the, in the tube. And so you're probably going to lose both the mom and the baby unless you do something. So they rushed her off into surgery, and it could be classified as an abortion. And so we had to stop that pregnancy because it was a tubular pregnancy. And boy, it basically saved her life. 
that's a different category. I think we want to talk about when it comes to abortion. So technically, if we believe that life begins at conception, we don't have eight kids. We have 12 kids. But the problem is we become so confused in our society that we don't believe life begins at conception. We believe life begins at birth. And so my question is, then what's been happening the last 40 weeks in your belly? Why are you going back and forth to the doctor? Why are you getting sonograms? Why are you watching? <laughs> what were you watch what you eat? You watch every bite. Uh, <laughs> watching what you eat. Why are you taking all this stuff? Why are you going through all these exams if, if there's no life there? And so I think our actions speak counter to what we say when we say, well, life doesn't begin until the baby's born. So, boy, the idea of conception, life begins at conception. But the question becomes, does life begin at conception when we know about it? I'm getting deep with you, I know. Oh, boy, does life begin at the conception of God? Jeremiah says, I knew you for you were formed in your mother's womb. Does life begin at conception or did life really begin when God conceived of the idea of you being conceived? To interfere with the, um, with the idea of abortion is not just to abort your idea, it's to abort God's idea and what God had in store when he thought you up. It's the conception of God, then it's the conception of man. So watch this now. Before we think about the conception of mankind, well, boy, we conceived on this day. Think about the conception of God. Watch this now. Many of you all have been cheating yourself on how old you really are. Most of us are at least 40 weeks older than what we say. <laughs> That's theologically true. First word is compassion. And we do have compassion for everybody who's gone through this thing called abortion, whatever your role and your part in. The second thing is conception. The third thing is consideration. I got a couple of questions here. These are some tough questions, interesting questions, and well, we debated about using this illustration. How many of y'all have heard of greens? Anybody here from the South? Anybody heard, 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 heard some greens, right? And so, boy, when you come and get greens, you know, most guys want the process of, of greens. For, first, you've got to go pick the greens, right? And so, we see folks, boy, um, they be wrestling and fighting at Christmas time over, give me them greens, right? And so, boy, on the greens, and boy, when you go through and boy, you come to get greens, you don't just take the greens and dump them into the pot, do you? You come to the greens and you begin to pick through the greens and look at the greens, and you know, boy, you got some you're going to keep and some you're not going to keep, and some are good for cooking and some are good for the trash, and some are good for juicing and some are not good. And so what you're doing is you're going through all of these greens, and like in this green, boy, there's a, there's a little small hole in that green, a bug ate through that green, and there's a hole right there, but you know, we're just, we're just going to take that off, we're gonna, but we're still going to keep the green, and, and so I don't want to waste my money on these greens. Boy, you begin picking greens. And so, boy, you get the greens you like. I said I was going to sit down the whole time. I'm sorry. And so, boy, boy, you get the greens you like. it, And, boy, you dispose of the greens you don't like. Why do we treat babies like greens? We pick the ones we want to keep. And we dispose of the ones we don't want to keep. It's interesting, the medical community, they have a variety of tests, and I forget what the test is, but we always passed up on, it cost 300 some dollars, but um, what's that test called? Um, when they're trying to figure out if there are any um, abnormalities in the baby, and um, y'all know, any women here? <laughs> all righty, all righty, um, amniocentesis, there you go, you're in the spirit today. The amniocentesis, right? And say, well, boy, do you want to get the test for the, I mean, but we'll say, no, not really, because no matter what's happening, we're still going to keep the child. 
Okay? Watch, watch what you pray for. Well, you know what? I'm having a boy or a girl. You know, I don't care what I'm having as long as the baby is healthy. Let me ask you a question. If the baby's not healthy, what are you going to do? What? Do you see how society has influenced us and in our perception of the value of kids? Let me ask you a couple of questions, all right? Which one of your kids would you consider disposable or dispensable? Which one of kids would you consider disposable? You know what? I just don't need you no more. You know what? It's just not good for you to be here anymore. Okay? Which one of your kids would you conclude is not exactly what God designed them to be? In other words, your child is not perfect. Why should the mom get the thrill and the baby have to pay the bill? Do we have the right to deviate from God's word for the baby in the womb because things may be difficult outside the womb? Most people who get an abortion, it's not because of theological reasons. It's typically not because of medical reasons. It's typically because I don't want the circumstance. It's going to be an inconvenience in my life. It's going to interfere with my green. No, 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 not these greens. My money. It's going to interfere with my career. It's going to interfere with me going to medical school. It's going to interfere with nursing school. It's going to interfere with my job. It's going to embarrass somebody. Are we tracking together? And so, and so, and so, and so, um, 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 or you know what? I can't afford to pay for the baby. Statistically, the majority of those who get divorces are impoverished. I think it's something like 75% of the ones that we can track. I think 75% are impoverished. They're in poverty. And so now the argument comes, why should I be forced to have a baby because I can't afford it? You should have thought about that when you spent the money on the hotel to get pregnant. We good? And then why not just trust God? How many of y'all felt like you could afford to have a baby? <laughs> if you ever had kids, you know you can't afford to have no kids, right? You just figure that thing out on, on the go. Amen? Amen? What about the positive impact of people who have made great contributions to our world? What would have happened if you were aborted? What would our culture be? What would our world be? What would our society be? What would happen if Michael Jordan was aborted? What would have happened if Einstein was aborted? Go down the list. And say, so every time we abort somebody, we had no idea of their potential at that time. And so when you abort somebody, you abort their mission. And you have no clue or no idea what they're going to do, what they're going to become, how they're going to do it, what they're going to overcome to make the contribution that God has called them to make. Are we tracking together? I read this. I read this um, yesterday. I read this. Um, I, I, thought, I thought it was a pretty cool quote. I've noticed that everybody that is for abortion has already been born. Y'all good? Not trying to be snarky. I'm trying to help us think through the issue and, boy, what are we really saying when we come to this issue and what's transpiring and what's going on? You know, what's interesting is that when it comes to this issue of consideration, none of us would consider our kids disposable or dispensable because they're outside the womb. Then why would you consider <clears throat> a baby inside the womb to be disposable or dispensable? People say, well, well you know what? Okay, 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 okay then. Who gives you the right to say what happens on the inside of my body? So you know what? I'll give it you 100%. Nobody has the right to tell you what to do with your body. Nobody has the right to tell you what you can consume in your body, what you can do with your body, where you can go with your body. But the problem is we're not talking about your body. We're talking about what's inside of your body. Are we tracking together? And so a baby is not your body. What you do with your body influences the baby, but that's no longer your body. 
that baby is there on lease. The baby's there for 40 weeks or sometime sooner. And so that's another body. Are we tracking together? Anybody ever heard in the legal system something called ad litem? Ad litem is, is, is when, the courts, when the courts will assign somebody to go and look out for the interest of a child. It very often happens in, um, in um, divorce disputes or, or things where a judge is questioning if the parents are looking out for the best interest of the child or there may be some question there. So what the court does is the court will uh, assign somebody called ad litem. And the job of the person who's ad litem is not to raise the kids, it's not to put the kids through college. The job of ad litem is to look out for the interest of the kid while they are potentially in danger. Potentially in danger. If we have ad litem outside the womb, why can't we have spiritual ad litem inside the womb? We already have a system in place to look out for the interest of kids when they may be in danger of their parents' decision. And so abortion rights help to um, um, deal with that in utero. Are we tracking together? Here's the challenge. We've got to shift from a social and political faith to a biblical <clears throat> and a theological faith. Y'all good? Amen. We got to think through these issues, all right? So watch this now. A woman can do whatever she wants to do with her body, but the baby inside of her is not her body. She has a stewardship, not a lordship. The next word is clarification. Abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Read your Bible. Stop reading Facebook. <laughs> it's just not. So to go and tell a woman who's had an abortion, you're going to hell because you had an abortion, that's not biblical. Amen. You are in eternal peril because you've had an abortion. That's just not true. Amen. Now, we're not going to encourage you to have an abortion. It's not an unforgivable sin. We're not trying to lighten the consequence of abortion. We're not trying to skew the issue. But when you read your Bible, um, abortion is not the unforgivable sin. Are we tracking together? So if you're here today, and boy, statistically, one of four women have abortions. Statistically. And so we count all of you up, a fourth of you all statistically have had an abortion. And Satan is trying to make you feel guilty for the rest of your life because you had an abortion. So if I thought you were pro-life, I am pro-life. But that means I'm pro the life of the person who had an abortion too. Are we tracking together? Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. First chapter 1 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're carrying a weight and a ball, thinking God is still against you, God is upset with you, God is mad with you, God is against you, God is not going to prosper you, that's just not biblical. Might be emotional, but it ain't biblical. We're tracking together. Abortion is not an unforgivable sin. And what Satan wants to do is bring you down by any means necessary. I want to kind of redefine and tweak the definition of abortion because in some of the Christian conservative circles, there's not enough delineation and nuancing when it comes to the issue. Abortion is the voluntary and unnecessary intentional termination of a pregnancy. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about in, well, with the ethical dilemmas of, of rape and incest and, um, and um, mother's health or baby's health. We're talking about the intentional and unnecessary termination of pregnancy. We got to nuance that. Early termination is the termination of a pregnancy due to foreseeable death of the mother, baby, or both. And I gave you guys the example of an ectopic pregnancy. Three is ethical termination. It's the termination of a pregnancy due to rape, incest, or forced impregnation. We got to wrestle with that issue. We need God's wisdom on the issue. So, boy, even if you got pregnant 
apart from traditional approved means, is that baby a mistake? That's an ethical issue. How many of you all had, had what you call the mistake baby? Don't raise your hand. A vacation baby. One more than what you anticipate. Oh, Lord. What the <laughs> What's that happening here? Watch this now. And so, boy, would you that, boy, that was outside of God's will. And then when it comes to this issue, guys, it's important for us to understand that, 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 that boy, God um, wants us to make things between peripheral issues and essential issues. Y'all good? It's a heavy issue, guys. Watch this now. I heard folks say, well, you know what? Well, what if you can't afford to take care of the baby? And my concern about the abortion laws and restricting abortion is that they pro-life in the womb, but they're not pro-life outside the womb. They're okay with taking care of the baby in the womb, but don't help the baby get through college. They're okay with taking care of the baby in the womb, but boy, ain't going to buy no diapers, this, that, and, and all the other. And I'm saying, what does that have to do with the primary issue of saving this child's life? I'd much rather talk about diapers, tuition, and school with a living baby than diapers, tuition, and school where there is no baby. Now we're tracking together. Because God is capable and God is able to do whatever he wants to do. So watch this now. What's the correction? Abortion, some are floating the idea that abortion is in the best interest of the mother. When you read the Bible about the sanctity of life, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, as humans, we are made in God's image, distinct from other animals. How can we ever conclude that abortion is in God's best interest and or the mother's best interest? I thought what God said was in our best interest. Abortion, apart from the ethical exceptions, is not in the best interest of the individual, the biological parents, society, or the baby. So I heard one lady arguing yesterday, well, boy, you, you don't know what it means to, um, to take care of a disabled child. And I'm sensitive towards that, right? And, boy, you don't know what it means to take care of a baby who's got this kind of sickness or this kind of illness. And so we come across people all the time who've got special need children. We say, you know what? God gives special need children to special parents. Because it does take a special capacity. It does take a special mindset. But God will give you the grace to do what needs to be done. And so what happens is many of us function with a utilitarian ethic. Y'all thought I was just a pretty face, didn't y'all? <laughs> Smile at me. We didn't, Pastor. You ain't got a pretty face. You ain't got a pretty face or a pretty mind. Smile at me already. Watch this now. What is the utilitarian? Utilitarian value says, you know what? You're only as good as what you can produce. You're only as good as you can produce. And so watch this now. If you want to start taking out babies in the womb because of their trajectory, you're going to start taking out senior citizens because of their trajectory. Amen. So that once you get to a point to where we don't consider you societally useful, we're going to dispense of you. We're going to dispose of you. Remember Kevorkian? People had a problem with Kevorkian, right? We might have Kevorkian trying to take people like they're older. Blah, blah, blah. That's a utilitarian view. And so, boy, what, what value does life have apart from what you can produce? So watch this now. The correction is that, is that abortion is in the best interest. Abortion is never um, in the best interest of the mother, barring the ethical exceptions. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As high as the heavens are above the heavens, so are your thoughts above our thoughts and our ways. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, the boy, um, Cursed is the one who trusts in man. That's a curse. Amen? Y'all still good? Yes, sir. So what are some truth claims? Let me give them to you real quick. Um, I, got, I got 10 truth claims to counter what the, um, what, the, what the pundits are saying. Number one, life begins conception. No, not that conception, but at God's conception of life. The lie is that life begins at delivery. We even, we even change, um, we even shortchange our birthdays by four years. So you guys ought to, ought to watch this now. Ask someone their age and, and, and then ask, is their conception, is that your conception date or your delivery date? Why didn't they count the other 40 weeks? Who said life begins at delivery? 
The Bible would tell us that life begins when God conceives us of that. Number two is restriction abortion restricts the mother's rights. You know what? We want mothers to have rights, but mother's rights should never trump human rights. Y'all good? Mother's rights should never trump human rights. So what the mother wants should never trump what God wants. Y'all good? The lives that mother's restricted, no um, no one restricted her right to have sex with someone um, else. If no one restricted her right to procreate, why does she have the right to restrict the decisions of someone else? Nobody's representing the baby's rights. Is that baby not made in the image of God? Sure, but a baby hadn't grown up and mature fully yet. But if that baby is conceived by God, isn't that baby made in the image of God? And so why is one image bearer more valuable than another image bearer? Y'all good? Truth number two, the mother should have full rights over her body, but not the body she's carrying inside of her body. Um, number three, truth number three, there are exceptions to the rule, but the rule should not be predicated on exceptions. So there's some, you know what, well, boy, we shouldn't have abortion laws and abortion rules because you got incest and you got rape. You know what, that's true, but what percentage of people who have abortions are having abortions because of rape or incest? It's a minuscule number of people. You don't make laws based upon the minor, minor, minor majority. You make laws based upon the majority. And then you have governing exceptions. Are we tracking together? Watch this now, number four. Just because man amalgamates social issues doesn't mean we should eliminate biblical issues. Is it a biblical issue or a social issue? Number five, all humanity is made in God's image. Watch this now. Stay with me here. Okay, I'm going to rub some feathers here. It's not merely the material maturation, but the immaterial realization. When the Bible speaks of mind, body, and soul, here we go right here. When the Bible speaks of mind, body, and soul, that's not the total summarization of mankind as traditionally taught and thought. You say, well, Pastor, first of all, it says mind, body, and soul. Read the context of mind, body, and soul. Read the context of first of all. It doesn't tell you this is the order to organize all of humanity. The Bible also uses other terms. Romans 12, 1 talks about the mercies of God, the splachna of God. It talks about, talks about the heart of man. It talks about the soul of man. And so how do you arbitrarily go to one passage and then summarize everything under that passage when the Bible doesn't say summarize everything under that passage? So mind, body, and soul is a man-made categorization. It's a man-made organization. Now, I'm not saying man doesn't have mind, body. Man does have mind, body, and soul. I'm arguing it's probably more complex than that. And so maybe we ought to start arguing for the material aspects and then the immaterial aspects of mankind. And then we have two categories that captures everything without conflicting with what the Bible says. Y'all good? I'm going too far. Y'all good? So well, it's the material part of man, then it's the immaterial part of man, and then when you keep it that way, some call a complex trichotomy. What does the Bible say to some of humanity? Maybe it's wise to do that the Bible does not use that phraseology without assigning that meaning. And boy, I just kind of just explained that. Are we tracking together? Um, number six, God's revelation doesn't change because humanity finds it inconvenient. So because we find having babies inconvenient, because we got these social issues, but we want to eradicate that. Okay, here you go. Number eight, we don't just need the revelation of God for these issues, but the illumination of God to manage these issues. It is complex. It is complex. It's not simple. And there are no easy cut and dry answers. And we read somebody's Twitter post, you know what? That should be law. For real? After 140 characters, that convinced you. 140 characters convince you that's the way to go. Number nine, humanity is better off when they follow God's truth. It is being debated legally, medically, and financially if, if following God's truth is best. Okay, you know, watch this now. If you don't want to put together laws to protect people who can't protect themselves, then get rid of all the laws. Get rid of lemon car laws. Get rid of speeding laws. 
get rid of, you know what, it's not wrong to just go put a gun to somebody's head and rob them. If you want to stop imposing on somebody else, say, well, pastor, that's, that's just different. What's the difference? You can recover from somebody stealing from you. You can recover from a lemon car. You can recover from somebody breaking into your house and stealing all your stuff, but you can't recover from an abortion. Which one really is more serious? If we got these lesser laws, why not cover these greater laws? Number 10, long precedence does not justify wrong precedence. Long precedence does not, I would do two weeks, but I'm going on vacation next week. Smile, smile at me. Turn it all in the day. Smile at me. <laughs> long precedence does not justify wrong precedence. Say, well, it's been 50 years. How can you come back and change this after 50 years? Well, if something's being wrong, I'm done wrong for 50 years, you ought to stop it. Amen. It's never too late to do what's right. Don't become so committed to a false philosophy of living that you never want to turn around. And sometimes we don't change our mind because we've done it some. The same way for so long, we just refuse to change our mind. Watch this now. In 1954, there was Brown versus Board of Education. You guys remember this? And boy, um, um, th that law was um, predicated upon Plessy versus Ferguson, which came in 1896. In 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson said, Separate but not, I mean, separate but equal is okay, and we can divide blacks and white. But in Topeka in 1954, what is that? 58 years later, they said there's no such thing separate but equal. It just doesn't happen that way. Did we argue against how long it took to get rid of segregation? Why do you go argue against what it took to do the right thing in America when it comes to abortion? Last thing, okay. What's the church do? Real quick. I know y'all getting tired on me. Y'all getting tired. Y'all getting tired. Y'all getting tired. The last word's communication. What is the universal church's responsibility? How should the church respond? Y'all good? Yeah. Number one, continue to teach biblical truth about abortion and other ethical issues as well. Amen. Number two, sponsor and our support pro-life biblically in juxtaposition to politically. Number three, vote for candidates that hold a pro-life position. Here is the problem when we vote. We typically vote based upon popularity and not position. That's why, boy, you ought to um, be part of a supra-partisan party, not part of um, an um, independent, Republican, or Democratic. Because when you buy into the platform, there are flaws with everything man has come up with. Amen. You want to attach yourself to what? With, with what God came up with, a supra-partisan party. Are we tracking together? And so what happens here, we come here, and then, boy, we have tied ourselves into these positions, and now we're stuck. And when it comes to voting, watch this now, we elect people who say one thing and do something else entirely different. We demand justice. We demand change. Let me ask you a question. How will you know when that justice is achieved? What? How will you, and boy, this is not a statement, President Obama ran an entire campaign on change but never specified what the change would be. He ran an entire campaign, and boy, I am pro-Obama, pro-Michelle, pro their pro kids, pro all that already. Watch this now. Love to see him talk, love to hear him talk, think he's the genius of a man. He ran an entire campaign on change, but never delineated what was going to change. That's why Tom Joyner, what was the other guy named Cornell West, what's the other guy named, and Tavis Smiley got upset with him. They said, well, you're not making change for African-Americans in the world. The, the response is, what change did I promise you I would make? What specific changes did I promise you I would make? What people did was they made an assumption. And they made the assumption that when he said change, he had the same thing in mind that they had in mind. 
but never ask the question. Give us a list of what you're going to change. And then when it comes time for re-election, let us go see what on that list, what kind of progress have you made on what you've committed to us? So we talk about reform when it comes to, yeah, we ought to reform how we elect people. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have voted for Obama. I'm saying that we ought to put together a list and hold people accountable to what they say they're going to do. Pray for states that have yet to introduce and enforce a pro-life position. So I think there are about 26 states now who've got um, uh, legislation in place for anti-abortion. Number five, be strong and courageous in holding a biblical position. Remember that we live in an era of 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 4 where people will have itching ears and turn away from God's word. Number six, responsibly support life outside the womb. Amen. Number seven, help those who have spiritual, emotional, and mental trauma and room, wounds from their participation in abortion. Many men have encouraged women to get abortions against their will. Amen. Amen. Number eight, men must use their influence for good and not for bad. And number nine, the church should promote harmony amidst so much disunity. Amen? So that was six words. I'm done. Smile at me. I kept my seat most of the time, right? I didn't want to be a mad black man screaming at church. But I did want to give you something to think about. Now I want you to look at it. It's probably a little bit deeper than what we have anticipated, isn't it? I want to ask you all to make these considerations as you think about your particular position when it comes to abortion. And ladies, if you're here, there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So if you walk out of here condemned, you're walking out of here unbiblically. Amen. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You're not bound towards hell. You're not secondary. You're not inferior. You're, you're not damaged goods. You're not flawed. You are made in the image of God. Amen? And men, if you encourage somebody to get an abortion, just repent. Ask God for forgiveness. I was selfish. I was prideful. I was wrong. And ask God for forgiveness. Let's pray. So, Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. And, God, as we look at these greens right here, Father, I pray we don't pick our kids like we pick greens. I pray, God, we don't pick people like we pick greens. I pray, God, we don't treat embryos like agriculture, vegetables. I pray, God, we recognize the distinction of mankind and the dignity of mankind. And I pray, God, that, Lord, we would value life, life outside the womb and life in the womb. I pray, God, we keep the main thing the main thing. And I pray, God, we don't confuse the peripheral from the essential.